Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a brand new series for 2024 entitled Psalms. You might, I think you could probably guess where that comes from. And in this first lesson for January 6th of 2024, we're going to learn about how to read the Psalms. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we turn to this largest book in the Bible, help us to gather from these poetic expressions the truths that you want us to learn, you want us to know, and perhaps even learn how we can get to know you better is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Today we begin our study of the book of Psalms, also known as the Psalter. Notice all the silent Ps. In order to get a little clearer understanding of why they say what they, uh, what they do, we need to understand, one, who wrote the Psalms, two, why they wrote, and three, what the circumstances were. That sounds like a very obvious thing to say about anything you read, right? Mm -hmm. We also need to know that Jesus and the apostles clearly believed that the songs or the songs or psalms were inspired. What do we know? How do we know that, Jim? Luke chapter 24, verses 44 and 45. Then he, that is Jesus, said to them, for on the well on the road to Emmaus, these are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written in the, excuse me, written about me in the law of Moses, the writings of, of the prophets and the Psalms had to come true. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. From the American Bible Society, Good News Translation. Okay. Psalms is a book of hymns and prayers. Despite the fact that some Psalms raise questions in our minds, Hmm, I wonder what that, how that would happen. About what was going on, we still believe that the Psalms were inspired by God to represent the full range of human emotions and responses to environments that are common to human beings. Could words that apply to vengeance, uh, that apply vengeance against one's enemies be inspired by God? Are you allowed to express vengeance against your enemies? Well, some scholars believe that the Psalms are quoted in the New Testament more than any other Old Testament book. And there's pro that's probably true. I, I'm sure there's probably some people would come say, well, maybe Isaiah is quoted more, but anyway, you, if you compare Mark 12, 10 and 11 and with Psalms 118, just to look at it, quick, a quick look at these things, Surely you have read this, this scripture, the stone which the wilderness rejected is worthless, turned out to be the most important of all. This was done by the Lord. What a wonderful sight it is. And if you go back to the Old Testament and you go to Psalm 118, 22 and 23, the stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out, be, turned out to be the most important of all. This was done by the Lord. What a wonderful sight it is. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And there's lots of others. Uh, maybe I'll give you um, one that's a bit of a challenge. Psalms 82, 6. You are gods, I said. All of you are children of the Most High. You are children of the Most High. That would make you what? I'm sorry. And you keep going to the next verse. It says you're going to die like men or die like princes. Yeah. I'm not talking about all of you. I know those I've chosen, but the scripture must come true that says the man who shared my food against turned against me. I'm sorry, I clicked on the wrong button here, uh, John 10, 34 and 35. Jesus answered, it is written in your own law God, that God said, you are God's. We know that what the scripture says is true forever, etc. So if we are children of God, how do you express the, the term for children in Aramaic or Latin? Benny? Well, that's, that would be, uh, but, that, yeah. But literally, if you say someone is human, if you look at the book of Ezekiel, that's very common. It says, son of man, son of man. Mm -hmm. And basically, that's a way of saying a human being. So that's why Jesus can be called the son of man and the son of God. Son of man means he's human. Son of God means he's divine. So 
when this person says you are gods what is he saying he's saying you are children of, of the heavenly father in psalms 82 that is a variation yeah. on elohim yeah well there's elohim is one of the names for god so, he's known as an elohim yeah how many different people do you think contributed to the psalms have you ever tried to count and how long a time span do you think it is, is covered by the psalms do you consider them all inspired or who and who wrote the most we probably could guess at that right mm -hmm. probably david did you could do you consider the hymns in our hymn books to be inspired well i hope not, some of not them the words <laughs> well that's what we're talking about here why would the psalms be different do you think there were they were uninspired there were uninspired psalms that may have been used in the temple services sure would it be safe to pick a verse from any portion of the Psalms and use it to by itself apart from its context? Carrie, from Nelson's Bible study. Okay. The Psalms were originally individual poems. With the passing of time, these were collected to form smaller books. The book of Psalms in its present form comprises five of these smaller books, and it says see below. We'll talk about that later. The earliest known individual psalm is that of Moses. Did you know Moses wrote a psalm? Mm -hmm. uh, psalm 90. The latest is probably Psalm 137, which could not have been written before the 6th century B.C. Though most of the Psalms were written and collected during the, the Davidic era, or shortly thereafter, the final compilation of Psalms was probably not complete until the latter half <coughs> of the 5th century BC. During the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, 450 to 425 BC in brackets, okay. Thomas Nelson publishes and if Nelson's complete book of bible maps etc and charts etc okay so what are we saying here we're saying these things were collected they were put into small books and and they were known as the psalms probably at that time and then maybe another collection and another collection another collection another collection and finally who was it that put together the first collection that we could kind of call a bible ezra so guess what he did the psalms put put those three or four or, four or five of those little books together and that's how we come up with our psalms no other book of the bible includes writings from so many different authors as does the psalms that's not too surprising they span of the sp they span of time from moses to ezra and nehemiah af after the babylonian captivity jennifer from the bible study guide by way of introduction to this quarter study we will touch on the following preliminary topics Number one, the historical background to the books of Psalms. Number two, the various genres or categories of songs in the collection. And number three, biblical guidance for worship. Additionally, we shall enlarge our study of the Psalter by surveying the following subjects. The structure of Psalms, the various literary tools the psalmists use to express their emotions, and the distinct divisions of books within the Psalter itself. Okay, from our Bible study guide. The Psalms were written in the form of poetry. Poetry was not the same in ancient Hebrew times as it is in our day. There was no rhyme as we would understand it. Their rhythm consisted of parallelism, imagery, merism, and word plays that are very difficult to translate from one language to another. So a lot of people will say it's just marvelous to be able to read the Psalms in Hebrew because a lot of things you miss if you can't, don't understand Hebrew. So, some of the major foci of the Psalms, Duane? Oh, well, we have nature, Psalms 8, 19, 29, and 104. Yeah, you don't need to mention all the Psalms, just mention the list there, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Historical and national, didactic, messianic, deity, sonship, incarnation, priesthood, betrayal, rejection, resurrection, ascension. Okay, now let me just say a word or two about that last couple of categories. One of the problems we have in trying to deal with 
the Jews, or one of the problems they had in dealing with Jesus was they took some of these passages which we now, from the Psalms, but a lot of them from Zechariah and places like that, we now know apply to the second coming, and they wanted them to apply, they talk about the Son of Man comes in all his glory and so forth like that. They wanted those things to apply to the first coming of Jesus. And so that's why they had the very perverted or distorted ideas of, of what the, the coming of the Messiah was going to be like. So some, some of the stuff from Psalms contributes to that. Okay, from the Believer's Bible Study, Study Bible, Gordon? Typological prophetic psalms, such as uh, Psalms 22, where the writer describes his own experience, which is transcended by that of Jesus the Messiah. Two, indirectly messianic, such as Psalms 2, 45 and 72. These were penned for a king of Israel or a royal occasion in general, but their ultimate and climactic fulfillment is realized in Christ. And three, typical messianic psalms. These are less obvious. The psalmist in some sense is a type of Christ, but not all aspects of the psalm necessarily apply to the Messiah. That's from Believer's Study Bible. Okay, now I want, to, I want you to stop and think about that because this is, this is going to impact how we understand everything we studied this quarter. Um, how many well, how many of the, of the early Christians were able to read? Early Christians? What percentage? Uh, I don't think too many uh, fishermen went to elementary school. No, they didn't. Many of them didn't. They probably, since there was so much involved with Christ and so forth, they probably, most of them probably learned how to read some at least. But in the general population, there was a very small percentage who were able to read. Furthermore, the Bible that they had in those days, which was the Old Testament, was written, written in a language which they no longer spoke. So that was another challenge. You, they were supposed to study it, at least some, in their, in, their, in their schools as they went through up to higher levels of school, but it wasn't really commonly known. So when you could read something and well well you know that when they went to where well, they went to the synagogue what would happen someone would first call out a scroll and read a portion from scripture and then the one who is giving the presentation would actually sit down on a special chair in the front of the synagogue and ex try to explain all of that he of what what that passage was about because they were reading in hebrew and they spoke aramaic at that time, yes so. exactly Exactly. Yeah. But in the Old Testament, though, uh, there was Aramaic still. Yes, Aramaic in the days of Even Daniel the, the and Daniel, son, right? Daniel and following, right. not before that. Right. Okay, so yeah. Daniel and following, they, they spoke Aramaic. But now, why is this important? So, did these people read newspapers every day? Of course not. Did they read books? Very few of them, if any. So if there was anything to be read, anything like this to be read, uh, it, would, it probably would get read again and again and again and repeated again and again and again in church services particularly. So, and we know from records that are kept that many, especially the boys, because unfortunately most of the girls didn't get to go to school, but they were expected to memorize large portions of scripture. So this is why, one of the reasons at least why, it shouldn't be surprising that it, these ideas were quoted sometimes verbatim and sometimes sort of not quite verbatim, but close to it, so often in, in the New Testament. That's why it talks about, you know, facsimile, I mean, not facsimiles, but similarities and types and so forth, all that kind of stuff. Okay, many of the Psalms, are, anybody have a question about that? Yeah, I think you understand the, the general situation. Many of the Psalms are meant to be used as communal worship songs or prayers. Okay, Charles. The Book of Psalms, sometimes called Psalter, includes the prayers and the hymns of some of the most important people in the Bible, from Moses 
to exiles in captivity, the Psalms are grouped into five collections of books as follows. Book number one, Psalms 1 to 41. Book number two, Psalms 42 to 72. Book number three, Psalms 73 to 89. Four, Psalms 90 to 106. And book number five, Psalms 107 to 150. Okay. okay. So then going on, we notice something else which is similar to some of the earlier books. Book one shows an affinity to the divine name Yahweh. Well, book two prefers Elohim. It's like Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. But Genesis 1, it's Elohim. Genesis 2, it's Yahweh. The reason for this phenomenon is unknown. Each of the first four books conclude with a brief doxology. What's a doxology? Prayer, isn't it? Doxos means praise. Right. Yeah. Doxology is the study of praise, is specifically actually. So a doxology is like what we say at the end of a prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. That's a doxology. Uh, within itself and constitutes an appropriate conclusion to the entire Psalter. Some see Psalms 1 and 2 as serving as an introduction and 146 to 150 serving as a conclusion. So you can, if you're good at these languages and good at reading the Psalms and sort of catching the ideas behind them, you could see patterns like they're suggesting here right through the Psalms. Jewish tradition explains the five book arrangement as a con conscious echo of the Pentateuch. Five books in the Pentateuch, five books in the, in the Psalms. Yeah, that's a bit of a stretch probably. But it is more probable that this is incidental rather than intentional. Indeed, the divisions between book four and five, Psalms 106 and 107, seems arbitrary. So a few more comments about what people might have done or how they were involved in the Psalms. First Chronicles 16, 7. These would be now in the days of David. It was then that David first gave Asaph and his fellow, fellow Levites the responsibility for singing praises to the Lord. Now, I'm going to ask you um, a question to think about and we'll, we'll deal with it a little bit more and a little bit later. Where, where was the major um, tabernacle, the major place where they would gather and pray? Think about that. Was there a church? Nehemiah 12, verse 8 says, Levites, the following were in charge of the singing of hymns of thanksgiving. Yeshua, Benui, Kadmiel, Sherebiah, Judah, and Metaniah. So even in the New Testament, psalms and songs are mentioned in a similar way. Jim? Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. Christ's message is in all its riches, richness must live in our hearts. Teach and instruct each other with all wisdom. Sing psalms, hymns, and sacred songs. Sing to God with thanksgiving in your heart. And then James 5, 13. Are any of you in trouble? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should Excuse me, you should sing praises to the Good News Bible. Considering what you know about the use of the temple in ancient times with altars and burnt offerings and a labor where only the priests were allowed to go, how does that fit with these ideas about communal worship? Where did the communal worship take place? You ever thought about that? <laughs> Not within the sanctuary. Not in the sanctuary, certainly not in the sanctuary. No. Not even in the outer court yet, I didn't think so. No. No. Um, oh, you, got, you got a couple million people out in the desert as a starter. That was okay. And where, who built the auditorium? Aaron did, didn't he? <laughs> well, Aaron was, <laughs> Aaron helped, helped build the tabernacle, but that wasn't the auditorium. The only, the only possibility is these, most of the time, these things were done in the open air. So how well do you speak to a million or two million people in the open air? Especially if it's windy. Yeah. So you think about the situation here. 
if these, if these, and clearly some of these psalms were seen to be directly to be used in communal worship of some kind. I mean, even when Solomon's temple came along, was there a big place to gather and worship? Well, the outside temple courtyard could gather probably a pretty good sized crowd, but certainly not a major portion of the Jews. Do you feel that they sang these psalms? To this day, yeah, by the way, well, some societies, uh, they yeah. do sing uh, the yeah. psalms to this day. They de definitely sang some of the psalms. I don't know that they sang all of them, but yeah, definitely sang some of them. Well, the original title of the book of Psalms was, and this would be Hebrew, of course, is Tehillim, in the Hebrew, or praises. That's what, that's what that word means. Our title of Psalms comes from the Greek word, psalmoi, found in the Septuagint. And what's the Septuagint? Greek it's a completely different Bible, right? <laughs> no, it's, it's a the Old Testament. Greek translation of the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. And there's very interesting stories about how that might have happened, but we don't have time for that right now. Some interesting subheadings are found under the titles of some psalms, suggesting who the author might have been or how they are to be sung, Charles, or, pray, or played, played as in on a, an instrument. So, um, clearly certain psalms were composed for special occasions. Jim? I think it's uh, Carrie's. I'm sorry, Carrie? Okay. The psalms were an indispensable part of Israel's worship. For example, they were used in temple dedications, religious feasts and processions, mm. as well as during the settle down of the Ark of the Covenant in Jerusalem. The songs of ascents, in brackets Psalms 120 through Psalm 134, also known as the pil pilgrimage songs, were traditionally sung during the pilgrimage to Jerusalem at the three major annual festivals. And in brackets, it's got Exodus 23, 14 to 17. Let, let me interrupt there for just a moment. Let us just rem remind ourselves that there was only one place that you were allowed to bring a lamb or any kind of a sacrifice to be offered. That was in Jerusalem. You were not allowed to do it in any place else. So there were major, major processions three times a year to go to Jerusalem. And that's only after the time of the Solomon's Temple. Being yeah, built. sure. Before yeah. that, it was elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. It was, what was it? it was the tabernacle that was, came from the desert. And for a while it was at um, Shiloh. Quite, for quite a while it was at Shiloh. Was it Gilgal sometimes, Bethel? No, it was never Gilgal, the, 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 the tabernacle. Was, the, the two places I know of are Shiloh and then... Um, uh, yeah, Not Bethel? Gib... Gilboa. Anyway, I remember the other place right now, but... Uh, Shiloh, I think, was for the longest period of time, well, in the in the inside the the territory. Of course, out in the desert for the first forty years, or part of parts of those forty years. So when these big groups of people would head for a whole group of people would be moving together, hundreds, thousands probably would be moving in a big group, and they would sing these songs and so forth as they were on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus did too. Yes, Jesus did on more than one occasion. He did particularly on his last time to Jerusalem, on his way up to, they were shouting, shouting and singing and hallelujahs on that last journey up to Jerusalem. They didn't know it was the last journey up to Jerusalem because they were sure that when they got to Jerusalem, they were gonna crown him king. They were sure, absolutely sure. The whole group, thousands of people probably, moved up there singing psalms and these psalms we're talking about here. Well, especially him calling Lazarus out of the grave. That did it. Yeah. They were going to crown him the king. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Okay, go ahead. The Egyptian Hallel. Uh, and in brackets, Psalms 113 through 118. And the great Hallel, Psalm 136, were sung at three major annual festivals, including the festivals of the new moon and the dedication of the temple. The Egyptian Hallel received a significant place in the Passover ceremony. 
Psalm 113 and 14 were sung at the beginning of the Passover meal and Psalms 115 to 118 rather at the end Matthew 26 30. The daily Hillel and again in brackets Psalms 145 through 150 150 and 50 is what I was trying to say was incorporated into the daily prayers in the synagogue morning services. Okay, so what do we know about the synagogues? One of the challenges to our understanding of how communal worship was handled in the Old Testament is that synagogues were believed to have come into existence during the Babylonian exile, when the temple in Jerusalem was in ruins. Some think that it was Ezekiel who was the founder. We don't know that for sure, but it's a possibility. It became much more common in the days of the Hasmoneans after 200 BC. In order for a community to have a synagogue, there had to be at least 10 adult Jewish males who constituted the elders or rulers of the synagogue. I've, so, I've heard before that if there were 10, then they had to have a synagogue. But you think it's the other way around that? Yeah. But I, it, it could be both ways. Yeah. So now back to our base. So what we're saying is that when we talk about synagogues, we're talking basically a New Testament phenomenon, not an Old Testament phenomenon. Okay. So who wrote the Psalms? From the Bible Study Guide. King David, whose name appears in the titles of most Psalms, was active in organizing the liturgy of Israel's worship. He is called, quote, the sweet psalmist of Israel, end quote, from 2 Samuel 23, verse 1. The New Testament attests to Davidic authorship of various psalms. And there's numerous Bible verses yeah. confirming that. Numerous psalms were composed by the temple musicians who were also Levites. For example, Psalm 50 and Psalms 20, 73 to 83 by Asva. Psalm 42, Psalms 44 to 47, and multiple other Psalms um, by the sons of Korah. Psalm we'll talk more about them later. Okay. Right. And Psalm 88, also by Heman the Ezraite, and Psalm 89 by Ethan the Ezraite. Beyond them, Solomon, Psalm 72, Psalm 127, and Moses, Psalm 90, authored some Psalms. So that's quite a collection of people, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, here's a question for you. What happened to the rest of the works of Solomon? Dwayne? 1 Kings 4.32. He, Solomon, composed 3,000 proverbs and more than 1,000 songs. Okay, where are the rest of those songs? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you guys. Apparently they weren't inspired. Well, that would be the question. Did Solomon have some inspired psalms and some uninspired songs? Or do we just not have all the inspired psalms? Or, yeah, or did people decide that some of them weren't worth copying? Do, do, is there evidence that he did sacrifice to other gods? The answer is yes. Even sacrifice his, his own, own children. Son. There you are. Right, right, right. Yeah. So they were not very inspired, sir. <laughs> some of them weren't. Yes. So if a psalmist was angry, discouraged, or depressed, and tried, cried out to God, should we consider his cry, including the words of despair or discouragement, as inspired? In what sense? Is it acceptable to express feelings of depression? What about Jesus' cry at the cross? Mm -hmm. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Right? And of course, that comes from where? Psalms. Psalm 22. <laughs> 22. Yes. Even in the, his words in Gethsemane. We can find lots of examples of that. We understand that the Holy Spirit inspired the psalmist to write what they did. But we also recognize that many of the feelings and ideas that were expressed and perfectly, fit perfectly with our situation in the 21st century. Do we need to cry or cry out more often in our situations? Recognizing that God is a part of everything we do and think and say? Wouldn't that be great? Mm. Okay, that's mine, I think. The Psalms of David pass through the whole range. This is from Ellen White. 
pass through the whole range of experience, from the depths of conscious guilt and self-condemnation to the loftiest faith and the most exalted communing with God, from Patriarchs and Prophets 754. And again, from Nelson's study guide, the Psalms lead us through the valleys and peaks of human experience, but in the end, they guide us to the praise of our loving Creator. The Psalms were written in the language of the human spirit, the utterances of the soul. The Psalms are not cool, reasoned prose, but deeply emotional works that use wrenching language, dramatic exaggeration, and figurative speech from the Nelson Study Bible. The Psalms were a form of Hebrew poetry. We sometimes speak of poetic license. When David spoke of soaking his bed with his tears, would you say that's poetic license? Yeah. <laughs> well, you never know. It's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think that was exaggerated? Is it okay for someone to use hyperbole under inspiration? Well, look at some of his other expressions. Tim, you get to look at these for us. All night I flood my bed with weeping, Psalm 6-6 six, six of the New Living Translation. Day and night I have only tears for food, Psalms 42-3 from the New Living Translation. You have recorded each one You've in collected. your... collected. You, yeah, collected. Oh, you have collected all my tears in your bottle. I missed that one. Hi. You have recorded each one in your book, Psalms 58.6, also in the New Living Translation. You 56.8. 56.8. You have fed us with sorrow and make us drink tears by the bucket full. Psalms okay. 80, verse 5, the New Living Translation. Rivers of tears gush from my eyes because people disobey your instructions. Okay, what do you think? Psalms. Any exaggeration there anywhere? Nope. <laughs> All literal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Poets are notorious for use of poetic license. This is not wrong, but it needs to be understood for what it is. David apparently felt that, like that at the time, and it helps us to recognize that in our day, those who are moved by powerful emotions, even depression, can cry out to God in honest prayer about how they feel at the time, and God will understand. Because it, just, just because it, those passages are in the Bible, does that mean God inspired them? Or can it be just the, the, the thoughts of the, of the well, editor or the, or the what? Well, the, the, writer. The, the problem is if you start down that street, you end up with a higher critic, and pretty soon, I mean, we have verses that say every word is inspired. Well, um, we, we have verses in Job, for example, that are clearly, clearly give the teachings of the devil. In, right. in Genesis 1, you have the devil's lie, right? The first thing he opens his mouth. Yeah. Sure. But we need, to, we need to understand that that's the way it is. Well, you, you, Job 42, here at the end of Job, you, you find out that some of those guys were not telling the truth. And how, and how many people ever search into it yeah, as to what were, what were the lies? Well, how often does Satan tell the truth? Well, once in a while when it serves his purpose. Well, even, even then when he's talking to Eve, uh, based upon past experience, he, he wasn't lying. He was just... Eve had a predisposition. I think we need to recognize that. Is everything that we sing in our hymns today theologically accurate? Terrible. Absolutely not. <laughs> Some of the worst theology you can find is in the hymns. What do we mean when we sing, God said it and I believe it, and that settles it for me? If prayer is conversation with God as with a friend, how could we sing while passing through the air, farewell, farewell, sweet hour prayer? Hold on, what? <laughs> Is it that we never plan to speak to God again? Do we feel comfortable singing about one of God's children as such a worm as I? That's, that's Luther, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Should healthy heterosexual men feel comfortable singing, I come to the garden alone, he walks with me and talks with me and tells me I am his own? Or is God also female? Ellen White, says that prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend, except to Christ 93. Okay. Well, the Lord himself says, I have espoused you to one husband. What about Handel's Messiah? Yeah. 
That's some good stuff there yeah, in is. that one. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't put that in the class of running yeah. the mail me, uh, hymns. That's, that's so if many of our hymns are to be regarded as prayers, then we will sing them as expressions of the original songwriters. Under some circumstances, they may represent our feelings at the time we are singing, but often they will not. That does not mean that we should not join in the singing. So if a song is being sung in church and it expresses the feelings of maybe 50% of the population, does that mean that the other 50% should sit down and not sing? Why are they singing? For whose benefit? Yeah, well, I mean, what's the point? Surely God doesn't need the, song, he needs the singing. Well, what should we do with passages in the Psalms which appear to be contrary to our Christian understanding of God? For example, that, Mine's that's yours. Okay, Psalms 2, 11 to 12. Serve the Lord with fear, lest he be angry, for his wrath is quickly kindled. From the Revised that Standard sounds Version. Like real true stuff about God, doesn't it? Yeah. Terrible translation. Psalm 77:10. It is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. Revised Standard Version. Okay. And we keep going. Oh, I'll go. Would it ever be appropriate to proper to describe the wrath of God as quickly kindled? We have many verses that say that God is slow to anger, and look at there's a whole list of them there. What should we do with such conflicts? Should we um, collect all the verses and stack them up or compare them somehow? Or could they, or, or count them? Should we look at ev for evidence in the stories to see if God is actually quick to get angry? Or should we just admit that this is a biblical contradiction? After reading the second Psalm for worship, what would you pray about? How do you suppose, and Dr. Maxwell used to talk about some of the verses, I mean, some of the chapters like, um, is it Ezekiel 16? Yeah, talks about God being married to prostitutes and all that kind of stuff. You know, hmm. where, where do you go with that? How about a movie? Yeah. Well, how do you suppose Jesus spoke the words, you are of your father, the devil? And who is he talking to? These were the, these were the church fathers. Yeah, these were the church fathers. That's, That's right. right, yes, sir. Yeah. The Sanhedrin. Yeah. What do we do with passages which appear to be shocking or harsh or author, author, authoritarian? Would it be acceptable for a mother to cry out as her child is dying? Was David still loyal and totally commitment, committed despite all his cries, all these tries? Well, Psalm 2 Verses 10, 11, and 12. Let me just open that up for us. Uh, Serve the Lord with fear. Tremble and bow down to him, or else his anger will be quickly kindled, uh, quickly aroused, I'm sorry, and you will suddenly die. Happy are all who go to him for protection. Well, this, this particular verse is a challenge even for translators. There are several verses in this chapter that do not sound like the normal picture of God that we uh, we have. See Psalms 2, verses 4, 5, and 9. And I don't, we don't have time to, the, the clock is, keep, is running, to look at that. But um, these, are, these are challenges we need, to, we need to try to figure out. Or is it that, uh, quickly, uh, that after we study through a book mm -hmm. and the entire scriptures, what kind of a picture do we have of our Heavenly Father? Yes. I think that's the, then we need to go from there and look into these different verses. Yes. So if you have a schizophrenic picture of God, which side are you going to come down on? You're going to embrace, it, embrace both of them, or are you going to search for, tr for truth? Okay, does God ever speak? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, that's fine. Does God ever speak very sternly to His children? Absolutely. What about Mount Sinai? Yeah. Look at Romans 9, 20. Look at that again real quick. And then you go to, how can I give you up, yeah. Israel? But who are you, my friend, to answer God back? A clay pot doesn't ask the man who made it, why did you make me this like, like this? How about Moses saying, hey, yeah. hey, block out my name? Yeah. We sometimes you uh, must discipline our children, and they fear us at the time. We hope that does not change the fact that we are normal, 
loving and kind parents. When people are acting uh, immaturely and not, talking, not taking God seriously, he sometimes finds it necessary to speak using very strong language. I mean, look at the, look at the Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't, and, and the three angels' messages, if you think that's something, the greatest example of this is probably the three angels' messages in Revelation 14, 6 to 12. God is willing even to appear harsh and fearsome if that is what it takes to get our attention so we may quietly listen to what he wants to say to us. Wow. So he raises his voice to get our attention and then talks softly? Yes. In the well, what did he do with, with Elijah? He wasn't in the earthquake, the wind, or the, or the fire. Yeah. And he talks as a still voice. small, full voice. Well, but you got to remember that just a short time before that, he spoke with lightning out of heaven. Right. It burned up the... Because the, the, there's another way to translate that. There's God, not another way to translate. That's it, a fact. It was a fact that well, that obviously we have a difference of up. opinion. But uh, when when the disciples say, "Shall we call down fire from heaven?" and Jesus says, "You don't understand," he he criticized the, the what, what I don't remember which disciple was. He says, "You don't understand which uh, who your father is. You're acting yeah. like the father." At that, John, you're referring to John a completely John different situation. It may be, but it's it's is it. <laughs> because that was the time, the, that time you're talking about was the time when Elijah was sitting on a hill and the king you know, sent his people out to arrest him. I'm and, talking about when Jesus was coming, coming down through Samaria or there or someplace, and, and the, uh, a similar situation, uh, the, Jesus, uh, the disciple yeah, says to him. That's, that's exactly the time we're talking about. It's the time when, that's where Elijah was sitting on the hill. No, and, Elijah wasn't there. Or Jesus was walking down the But the, the experience they were referring to was the experience of Elijah, not on Mount Carmel, but right there, which okay. was a time when he, when he, 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 he said, Lord, speak, you know, speak about these people who are coming to kill me. And he, 100 people died right there. That's, that's what, I mean, you can look it up. It's a reference. In the Psalms, we find hymns glorifying God for his faithfulness and love. The psalmist offered an un untiring devotion to God. This did not mean that they tried to overlook or ignore any problems that they were facing. Consider some examples of David's cries against his enemies. Psalm 3, 1 through 8. I have so many enemies, Lord, so many who turn against me. They talk about me and say, God will not help him. But you, O oh Lord, are always my shield from danger. You give me victory and restore my courage. I call to the Lord for help, and from his sacred hill he answers me. I lie down and sleep, and all night long the Lord protects me. I'm not afraid of the thousands of enemies who surround me on every side. Come, Lord, save me, my God. Let me interrupt for just a second. How many people would have liked to kill David? How many nations, entire nations, did he and, his, he and his army conquer? Thousands and thousands of people they killed. Okay, so you can, you can see he probably had a few enemies. <laughs> yes, so he says, Come, Lord, save me, my God. You punish all my enemies and leave them powerless to harm me. Victory comes from the Lord. May he bless his people from the Good News Bible. Okay, Duane, you want to take Psalm 33 there? All you that are righteous shout for joy for what the Lord has done. Praise Him, all you that obey Him. Give thanks to the Lord with harps. Sing to Him with stringed instruments. Sing a new song to Him. Play the harp with skill and shout for joy. In Psalms 109, verses 6 plus, choose some correct, corrupt judge to try my enemy and let one of his own enemies <laughs> accuse him. Is that, is, is that all right to pray for some corrupt job to judge to judge your enemy? Well, if, you want, if you want something bad to happen to him, yes. <laughs> there are very little that is new under the sun. Yeah. Verse 7, may he be tried and found guilty. May even his prayer be considered a crime. May his life soon be ended. May someone else take his job. May his children become orphans and his wife a widow. You know, may he die, in other words. Mm -hmm. May his the children... Temperature is the term. <laughs> may his children be homeless beggars. Oh, my Lord. May, may they be driven <laughs> from the ruins they live in. 
May his creditors take away all his property and may strangers get everything he worked for. May no one ever be kind to him or care for the orphans he leaves behind. May all, his, may all his descendants die and may his name be forgotten in the next generation. May the Lord remember the evil of his ancestors and never forgive his mother's sins. May the Lord as a blessing to the reading of the word. <laughs> May the Lord always remember their sins, but may they themselves be completely forgotten from the Good News Bible. Now, why did, did Yahweh inspire that? Absolutely. Or, oh, come on. <laughs> no, I mean, he, what he's saying is, God is saying, I recognize, I mean, this was someone who was crying out because he was really upset. And God says- He was depressed. Uh, he was, okay, so he's, okay. Best, you can, he's, he's not mentally stable at that point. Okay, but God is saying, I still love people who have under those circumstances. I'm not arguing that one, but the, God did not inspire that. That's a, a weakness on the part of the author of that text. Well, it's, it's a, a real live situation. I'm not, but, uh, but not. <laughs> and God says, I want, you, I want you to understand that these kind of things really happen. Would there ever be a time for these words to be used in church during worship? Mm. The ones we just read? <laughs> well, we, we did, done uh, Ecclesiastes, a, yeah. a little story of a, of a mentally ill. Man. Okay. Psalms, Psalms make the believing community aware of the full range of human experience. And they demonstrate the believers that believers can worship God in every season. In love, even when life, you're depressed, life, yes. even when you're crying out. In them, we see the following: the hymns that magnify God for His majesty and power in creation, His kingly rule, judgment, and faithfulness. Number two, thanksgiving psalms that express profound gratitude for God's abundant blessings. Number three. Laments that are heartfelt cries to God for deliverance from trouble. Yes. Number four, wisdom psalms that provide practical guidance, guidelines for righteous living. Number five, royal psalms that point to Christ, who is the sovereign king and deliverer of God's people. Number six, historical psalms that recall Israel's past and highlights God's faithfulness and Israel's unfaithfulness to teach the coming generations not to repeat the mistakes of their ancestors, but to trust God and remain faithful to his covenant. And wow. Okay. How many of the Psalms were originally prayers? Well, here's an example. Second Samuel. 23, 1 and 2. David, son of Jesse, was the man whom God had great, who God made great, I'm sorry, whom the God of Jacob chose to be king and who was the composer of beautiful songs for Israel. Mm. These are David's last words. The Spirit of the Lord speaks through me. His message is on my lips. Mm. And then coming to the New Testament, we read of Psalms 8, 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are. For we do not know how we ought to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us in groans that words cannot express. And God, who sees into our hearts, knows what the thoughts of the Spirit is, because the Spirit pleads with God on behalf of his people and in accordance with his will, from the Good News Bible. The psalmist mentioned a number of things about God to raise questions about our own personal experience. And there's a bunch of references again, Psalm 16, 44, 46, 47, 57, 68, 82, and 121. We're gonna see lots of examples of various kinds of expressions and different moods and so forth. These, are in, uh, these passages make it very clear that the psalmist felt that God was intimately with them at all times. Their word was God-centered. The worship of God and thoughts about God were front and center in the lives of the psalmist. That is a very different situation in the lives of most people in our day. How many, what percentage of uh, Americans do you suppose have God front and center in their lives? Everything they do, all day long and all night long. How many of us? How many of us? Yes, sir. Okay, Jim? 
from the Bible study guide. The Psalms are inspired prayers and praises of Israel, and so in the Psalms, the voice is that of God intermingled with that of his people. The Psalms assume the dynamics of vivid interaction with God. The Psalms address God personally as my God, O Lord and my King, Psalms 5.2 and Psalms 84.3. The psalmist the psalmists often implore God to give ear, Psalms 5.1, hear my prayer, Psalms 39.12, look, Psalms 25.18, answer me, Psalms 102.2, and deliver me, Psalms 6.4, all from the New King James Version. These are clearly the expressions of someone praying to God. And yeah, and those, those are just good examples. There are, there are lots more places that has something similar to that in other parts of Psalms. But that presents a problem for us in trying to understand where God is and what he actually does. So this is a problem for some of the psalmists as it might be a problem for some of us. Kerry? The psalmist is aware that God's dwelling place is in heaven. But at the same time, God dwells in Zion in the sanctuary amongst his people. God is at the same time far and near, everywhere and in his temple. That's from Psalms 11.4. Hidden, Psalms 10.1. And disclosed, Psalm 41.12. In the Psalms, these apparently mutually exclusive characteristics of God are brought together. Let me interrupt for a second. <clears throat> so how can God be far away in heaven and with us here? He's omnipresent. He's omnipresent, yeah. yeah. He's, he's f f we don't know how he does this, but he's fully aware of everything that's going on in every place, even our thoughts. So, yeah, we, these, are, these are ideas that it's hard for us to wrap our, our human minds around, but this is what the Bible says. Before David was, I am. I am. For Abraham was, I am. Abraham was, right, right. The psalmist understood that proximity and remoteness were inseparable within the true being of God, Psalm 24, 7 through 10. The psalmist understood the dynamics of this spiritual tension. Their awareness of God's goodness and presence amid whatever they were experiencing is what strengthens their hope while they wait for God to intervene however and whenever he chooses to do so. Okay, so we're talking about people here who are crying out to God under various circumstances and their words are recorded and God records them because he says, I am there when that happened. I, under, I heard those words and I'm, I'm here to respond and that's what we're gonna see in almost all of these Psalms. The Psalm ends with some word about God being present. Okay? Now can the Psalms help us understand that we cannot limit God to certain aspects of our existence only? What might be parts of your life in which you are seeking to keep the Lord at a distance? And that's from the Adult Sabbath School Study Guide. Yeah. And from our Bible Study Guide, Jennifer? The Book of Psalms provides evidence of some already existing collections of psalms. The Korahite collections for multiple psalms. Okay, let me, let me interrupt for there a second. Who is Korah? Korah, that, uh, maybe, hopefully that's not the one. Korah, Datan, and Abiram. Very These same. are the three? Mm -hmm. Same? Wow. This is the, he was one of the descendants of the Levites mm -hmm. that were, cooperated with those two people from the tribe of, of um, who was the first son? Anyway. Oh, Aaron. Huh? Aaron? No, the, the first one of Jacob's sons. Reuben? Reuben, yeah. These other, uh, uh, Dathan and Abiram from the, were from the tribe of Reuben. So they felt that they should have preeminence. Mm -hmm. And these are the ones who rebelled against Aaron and Moses. And Dathan and Abiram's and, and their entire families were swallowed up by the earth, yeah. but Korah was swallowed up, but his family was not, for reasons we don't know for sure, but these are the descendants of that Korah. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. 
So the Asaphite collection from Psalm 70. Okay, Asaph, who was he? Another of the priests. Okay, he was the one that David first appointed to be the leader of the singers at the temple. Okay. Um, then the songs of the ascents, Psalm 120 to 134, <coughs> the Hallelujah Psalms, multiple Psalms listed there. Psalm 7220 bears witness to a smaller collection of David's Psalms. While most Psalms are associated with the time of King David and early monarchy from 10th century BC, the collection of Psalms continued to grow through the following centuries, the divided monarchy, the exile, and the post-exilic period. It is conceivable that the Hebrew scribes under the leadership of Ezra combined the existing smaller collections of Psalms into one book when they worked on establishing the services of the new temple. The fact that scribes consolidated the book of Psalms does not take away from their divine inspiration. The scribes, like the psalmists, were devoted servants of God and their work was directed by God from Ezra 7, 6, and 10. The divine human nature of the Psalms is comparable to the union of the divine and the human in the incarnated Lord Jesus. And let's finish up with a comment by Ellen White. We have a little bit of time left. Go ahead, Dwayne. But the Bible, with its God-given truths expressed in the language of men, presents a union of the divine and the human. Such a union existed in the nature of Christ, who was the Son of God and the Son of Man. Remember what I said about the meaning of Son of God and Son of Man. Go ahead. Thus it is true of the Bible, as it was of Christ, that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. John 1, 14. From the Great Controversy page five. It's in the introduction, actually, to the Great Controversy. And our Bible study guide goes on, what does it mean that the Psalms are divine human prayers and hymns? How does this idea, however difficult to fully grasp, help us see the closeness that God wants with his people? So here's your question. Can these things, even though they sound pretty crazy, can they be inspired? How does it reveal in its own way how close to humanity and, each, and to each of us God is? God is trying to tell us that he is with us in every situation. Your spouse dies, a child dies. You may be crying out terrible things. I mean, that you felt like crying out terrible things. And these people did. And that's part of what we're going to learn about the Psalms. We need to be honest. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we have come to these Psalms, a challenging portion of Scripture. Help us to understand what you want us to know and to see the truth of what is presented here is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen.